Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, it's been a, a weird week. I, um... I feel like I got plenty done, and I've fallen behind at the same time. I wish I, I knew what was up with that. I took care of some big day job stuff, and, and I have more big stuff on the uh, the immediate horizon. And I, I drew some more trees, and I actually got out running three times last week. I took my old man to get his, his second vaccine dose on Sunday. I had to replace the toilet lever and did that. I I stayed on track with the 700 page book I'm reading for an upcoming episode. And, and with all that, there were these moments when I felt like I'm way behind or just irretrievably off course. It might be because I didn't record with anyone this weekend and, you know, kind of missed that sort of conversation. But, um, but the thing about that is something funny happened when I, I got dad vaccinated on Sunday. See, I was at the same community center uh, as the first dose um, out in, in Teaneck, and there were fewer people this time, so we got him jabbed and taken care of pretty quickly. Um, and then it was time to, to sit in the adjacent gym for 15 minutes, make sure he didn't have an immediate adverse reaction. All these other people were there, too. And I guided him over to a spot near the exit, and uh, and we sat down. And that's when I noticed an old lady a few seats over being attended by, I guess, her, her daughter. Um, and the thing is, I think the daughter was someone who used to work in my office. I mean, we all had masks on and she was wearing sunglasses too, but I was just pretty sure it was her, even though I haven't worked in that office in more than seven years. And I had this, this moment where it hit me like I've been griping for six months or so about how the pandemic and my home situation means there's no, there's no chance for chance. Like that, that there are no random meetings or encounters with people. Not for me. Like I'm, I'm not in the city, so I'm not out in the sidewalk, even in, you know, masked up and everything. There's still a chance you're going to bump into someone, you know, that doesn't exist in my life. Like for me, every conversation is a choice. Like I don't just go out anywhere and I haven't in a year. So I'm sitting there in this gym, suspecting that this person is, is someone I at least tangentially know. I mean, she's someone I once loaned a book to, and I, I, I never got back. Um, it was the text for Tom Stoppard's play, Rock and Roll, if you're, you're curious. Uh, she was a, a Pink Floyd fan. Rock and Roll is sort of about the early Sid Barrett, Pink Floyd, and whatever. Anyway, the point is, I just looked down at my phone. You know, it's not that I think she wouldn't remember me. I mean, she would say, oh, Gil, yeah, hi, how are you? But I just didn't want the hassle. I mean, if it wasn't her, it would have been weird that I asked. And and if it was her, did I really want to get into a conversation with her? And I mean, I also justified a moment later, did she really want to get in a conversation with me? So I just kept my head down, figured between the mask and the, the big giant shaggy mane of hair it would give her plausible deniability if she looked over and even suspected it was me and uh and that was that which is to say even after all this that we've gone through a year of all this craziness i still just can't be bothered but anyway Let's get to this week's show. Um, my guest this time comes all the way from Finland. She is Laura Lindstedt, and she has a new novel that sits out today in the U.S., My Friend Natalia from Live Right Books. And it is one weird, delightful, sexy, mind-bending novel. It's, it's about this woman, Natalia, who can't stop thinking about sex. And it's narrated by her new therapist, who 
comes to think that Natalia's case is going to become a sort of crossover bestseller of a, a self-help book, psychology book, and, and, and in the process, vindicate the therapist's PhD, about which the therapist is, um, harbor some resentment towards the, the psych community in Finland. Uh, so the therapist employs this non-traditional method of therapy known as layering, which takes Natalia's words and images and provides her with these exercises to get her to, to recombine them in, in ways that'll, well, uh, guide her out of her current hypersex perspective. And, and their conversations and these exercises, some of them are, are like written pieces that Natalia reads to the therapist. Other ones are in dialogue. And, and well, anyway, all this stuff delves into, into art and philosophy and, and childhood memory and sex and, and myth making and, and this tension of, of power dynamics between therapist and patient courses through like every word and, and image. It's a, it's a really powerful, affecting piece of writing. And I'm not sure if, if the strangeness that I felt from it comes from the fact that I've never been in therapy or, um, if there are aspects of Finnish culture that somehow make it seem stranger, or if it's just the, the sheer richness of Laura's writing and, uh, the translation by David Haxton. Um, regardless, I was just tantalized by this book, which is different than saying I enjoyed it, which I did also, but, but my friend Natalia also lures the reading or reader into a, into the room with the, the patient and the therapist in this, this really beguiling way. Um, it's a book. It's only been a few weeks, but it's, it's sticking with me more than some novels tend to do. Um, there's also enough of a potential for metafiction that, uh, leaves the book open to a ton of, of readings and misreadings, which Laura and I talk about. Um, starting with the fact that as I may or may not have implied here, uh, the therapist is never given a gender pronoun at any point in the book. It doesn't become overt, but, uh, it's up to the reader in some respects to figure out well, to decide, I guess, and decide whether it matters. Anyway, go check out My Friend Natalia. Uh, it's out now from Live Right. And, and let me know what you make of it. Now, as I mentioned, uh, Laura is Finnish, and she was a little concerned about doing an interview in English, but I think she did just great. Now, here's Laura's bio from her site. Laura Lindstedt is a Finnish author. She is a significant reformer of literary fiction and much-discussed critical darling. Her first novel, Sus Saxet, or Scissors, uh, was published in 2007 and nominated for the Finlandia Prize, the most prestigious book award for fiction in Finland. Her second novel, Oniron, a fantasy about the seconds after death, earned her the Finlandia Prize. Oniron was also a candidate for the Nordic Council Literature Prize of 2017. Her most recent novel is My Friend Natalia. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Laura Lindstedt. My Friend Natalia is such a, a verbal novel given that it's it's about these these therapy sessions it's being narrated by a therapist for whom language is is absolutely crucial in that respect how challenging is it to see the book translated how much did you have to work with translators and and did they um did they have unique challenges they presented to you as as part of the process Yes, uh, I I like to work with translators because I think that uh, it's the best way to get the best result. Uh, and for example, with my friend Natalia, I created a Slack channel so that we can change ideas collectively du during the process. And I think it worked well. Uh, there is two languages I can read, and English is one of them, and French is the other. And those manuscripts I have 
uh, read and and we have had a lot of discussions. But otherwise, it's uh, it's just that translators keep sending me questions and I try to answer as well as I can. But but I, I'm always open. I want to encourage uh, translators to contact me if they think that they have a stupid problem. It's normally not a stupid problem. <laughs> I want to give my help during the process. Mm. So it takes a lot of time from me, but I think it's worth of it. Yeah, it's it was actually a really fascinating article I read years ago about uh, translators of Thomas Pynchon, who it turned out had all of this correspondence with Pynchon, who is notoriously reclusive. And yet in these letters to his translators in, in South America and Japan and elsewhere, he was very forthcoming about the language and what he was trying to do. And, and you know, people just didn't realize that that whole treasure trove of of correspondence existed until one of the translators said, oh, yeah, I've got all these wonderful letters with, with Pynchon when we were working on this book. Um, in that respect, did did translators mention? Um, what, what did you learn anything from the questions they were asking? I guess were there things that occurred to you about the novel or about the language that you were employing that came back at you as they were as they were asking questions? Uh, of course, there are sometimes questions that I never can see uh, beforehand. They surprise yeah. me, kind of. And, and it, it means that the Finnish language is, in a way, it is very transparent to me. It's not, but, but uh, when I write it, I can't think this could be a problem. But then, of course, there are some uh, peculiar problems or, or uh, things to be solved out uh, in my friend Natalia. And I think it's that I play with Finnish words, which is very hard to translate into different mm. target languages. And uh, I also uh, take inspiration out of etymologies, Finnish etymologies, for example, other languages as well, but Finnish, and start to develop something out of it. So it is not just a small part of the book, but I can go very far with an etymological play. And how to get this translated, it, uh, it means that um, many translators uh, need to be creative when they translate. They have to take my work and think it through in their own language. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's, it can't yeah. be a literal translation, of course. Sure. Yeah, when I, I interview translators, I, I often ask whether they prefer translating work by living authors or deceased authors you know, knowing that they could consult with a living author usually. Um, and it really varies depending on the language and, and the focus for translators as to whether they prefer somebody who's long gone and they can just own the translation itself versus people who really like that, that interaction with the author, not to, you know, creatively rewrite their book, but at least to, to get some idea, you know, when, when something can be tricky like that. Yes. And in my friend Natalia, there are some things that are doomed to be lost in translation. <laughs> uh, one, my favorite example is uh, the international Latin-based uh, idiom per se in itself. Oh. And uh, the therapist, who is the narrator of the novel, uses this per se very frequently because they want to be uh, show the education and trustworthiness. They are professional on something. And if you put these two little words, per and see together, it is in Finnish language, it's per se, which means as. <laughs> so so um, you can't have that translated, but, but in the original text, uh, in the context of a novel which examines uh, body parts and female sexuality, etc., it is um, makes a kind of funny or comical uh, impact. <laughs> you know, I've I've never actually been in therapy. Should should I expect it to be as much fun and and as you know language pun based as the the sections with uh, sessions with Natalia? 
Uh, or, you know, we can go into some of the other things without giving anything away about what transpires in some of the sessions. But <laughs> Yeah, uh, of course, this is a therapy session, ther uh, therapy which is created for literary purposes. So if you put <laughs> kind of so-called normal therapy into literature, that would be boring because uh, this is totally uh, structured and uh, there is a lot of crossing of boundaries, which can happen in normal life as well. But this make, makes the therapy kind of thriller in my novel. There is a mystery, which is uh, the painting uh, on the therapist wall, your mouth. And, and it starts from that. Natalia uh, recognizes the painting and tells the therapist that it has been uh, her grandmother's uh, mm -hmm. in the years go by. So I would say that normal therapy is not <laughs> normally very funny. <laughs> it is, it is uh, uh, you just examine yourself and, and go deeper and deeper and deeper, but it's, it's not very funny to follow outside <laughs> It's just yeah. between you and ther therapist. Hmm. Yeah, tell me about the the therapist's layering theory and and how it relates to your own writing process. Yeah, um, it is a fictional method I have invented, but it is not very different from I would say the therapy that takes art uh, as a method or writing. And psychoanalysis is there in the in the bottom, of course. Uh, but the layering idea idea of layering is that the therapist tells Natalia that you don't really need to uh, just um, how would you say? I, I think it was like cr criticizing that that reflection the analytical reflection of, of, you know, standard therapy. Yeah. But. Yeah. And uh, uh, to remember the past things. No, mm -hmm. you, you can remember everything, but you can do with your memories, whatever you want. So this uh, fictional therapy, uh, the uh, layering therapy is based on artistic creation. And it is of course, parallel to writing itself. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that, for example, what I think of my writing, uh, it is that I do not have uh, plot lines uh, when I start to write. I don't think the work or characters uh, very much uh, before I write. I just start to write. And uh, this fictional world opens up little by little to myself. And then when I, when I write something that I'm interested in, I feel that this is true, this is interesting, this is something I want to follow, then I start to kind of investigate the thing I have written and go deeper and deeper, find the uh, historical strata there and my, follow my associations. So it is kind of layering my writing. Where did writing begin for you? When did it begin? Yeah. Tell, tell me about your writing life. Yes, I started to write even uh, when I wasn't able to write, actually. Hmm. I was like four years old, and uh, I liked to write the books that were uh, filled with uh, something like just t t x, 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 x things, yeah. not hmm. real words because I couldn't write. But I made a little booklets out of this so-called writing. It was like a calligraphy, <laughs> imaginary mm -hmm. uh, childhood calligraphy. And uh, I put images in it and I really made a little booklets. And then I read them to my mother. So that was my first uh, experience of write story and tell somebody a fictional world. Mm -hmm. But I think that it was, I, I started to write very early on, but it came uh, more intentional when I was uh, like 16 years old. I started with poems, but that wasn't the path I wanted to follow yeah. in the end. 
Hmm. And what moved you into to fiction? Um, I studied literature in university, and uh, I came there just to find the books and and the tradition and the history of literature to understand where I am, where I stand. And it, uh, I was, uh, I didn't write poems anymore because I didn't believe in me as a poet. But I didn't write anything, and, and that was very, very, very <laughs> desperate time in my life because I need felt that I need to write, but I couldn't. I didn't have kind of own language and anything I could continue with. But then um, it was I was a little bit under thirteen years old, and uh, just some words. Uh, kind of, they just came to me and I wrote, wrote uh, some lines. Mm -hmm. And later on, I found them again and I read them like, okay, this is interesting. There is a story. There is a core of a story. I don't know which is it, but I need to continue. And that was how my first novel uh, started, Scissors, which came out. 2007. And then you, uh, here we would say, and then you caught the bug, you know, then, then you were, you know, hooked on, on writing and prose again. Um, nothing is never very simple. <laughs> of course, yeah. it wasn't easy process. I wrote it, uh, seven years and it was painful because I really, uh, created the way I need to write during these seven years, but it wasn't, it didn't come just like that. I need sure. to work on it very hard. And, and uh, it was time when I didn't have confidence in my writing, but I still needed to continue. But, what gave uh, you that confidence? Yeah. Uh, um, when did you feel like you could actually... You know, I ask as somebody who's crippled by anxiety and the inability to to do any writing of my own. Um, I always wonder how other people manage to actually yeah. do it. Um, so, did you have a a moment where you felt that is, yes? That is a good question because uh, when you write, uh, you can never be too assured because the writing is stepping into the zone that is unknown. That is, with every book, is the same situation. But um, maybe it's that I just can't not write. I do write journal diaries, and I have mm -hmm. been doing it uh, systematically from since 1993. So now I have the uh, 43 uh, written diaries. And this keeps me going. It reminds me that I, if I want to be honest with me, I need to write. Otherwise, I'll be lost. Do you write the journal in the morning or the evening? Normally, it's the morning time. Otherwise, Good. when the Same day here. goes on, uh, it's I, I, I kind of uh, lose myself a bit. No, well, I'm, I'm with I'm you because if you if you yeah. don't get to it that evening, yes. then you feel like you 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 broke the streak, and then well, I, I say you, I mean me, and then you fall into a spiral of yeah, I missed it this day, I must miss it the next day. Yes. So yeah, it's first thing in the morning for me with my Absolutely. coffee. Absolutely. So yeah, so I do that writing, but not not anything real real. Yeah. But when you talk about uh, m when you mentioned going to university and, and sort of learning your place in literature, what was what was the the literature? Who were the influences or the the writers that you sort of saw and situated yourself around? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I found literature that I wasn't even aware when I was younger, mm. like Italo Calvino oh, and yeah. uh, Marie Duras. Uh, mm -hmm. Virginia Woolf, etc. So many classics and modern classics as well. And uh, one name I need to mention because it, it, it changed my life in many ways is mm -hmm. French author Nathalie Sarot. That, that's actually a question I have later yes, on about who, who your friend Natalia there. actually is. Yes, yes. <laughs> 
But uh, should I should I reply now or later? <laughs> no, on? no. Please tell us about it. Okay, a, okay. About I was. Uh, it was a, a late nineteenth when I did a seminar work on uh, Natalie Tarot, uh, her work, which is translated into English as the Golden Fruits, and uh, it happened that I have been working with Natalie Tarot ever since. So now it's almost eighteen years that I have been. Uh, doing a dissertation on her poetics. And this path uh, has been very important to me. And uh, at the same time, uh, it has uh, been very rough because it has taken so long time. Mm -hmm. And of course, my friend Natalia has uh, many, many references to Natalie Sarot uh, from starting from the name. Now, I will tell you my my secret theory about the book and mm -hmm. why I was happy to discover this. Um, throughout the the novel, the narrator, who is the therapist, you know, never gets gendered or named. And I finished the the novel, and then I saw on the the flap copy at the very end for your bio, uh, she lives in Helsinki, where she is revising her PhD thesis. Now, in the novel. We know that the therapist has had a lot of issues about the therapist PhD and getting accreditation within the the psychological community. And I had this moment of is is Laura actually the therapist and is her PhD thesis actually the the narrator's thesis on Natalia? And then I discovered your Natalie Saroch thing, and that that kind of um, created a big metafictional loop for me uh, around the book, which you don't need to to have in order to enjoy it, but gave me another layer of, of entertainment around the book. Yes. Actually, I have ab absolutely used the process with my dissertation, which has been <laughs> so long, yeah. process uh, as a source for inspiration in, for my friend Natalia and the therapist who has done the dissertation and not been acknowledged. Uh, of course, it, it reflects some of my feelings. Can you tell me about Sorot and and what it is in her work that that it either inspires or, or influences you? Yeah, uh, she created uh, tropisms, which is a biological phenomenon, uh, meaning, for example, in in the nature that a physical reaction towards something. For example, when the flower turns toward the sun. That's, that is a tropistic re reaction. And Natalie Sarot, uh, her uh, innovation, poetical innovation, was that she put this uh, tropisms into her poetics and starting point for all writing. And she has done nothing than writing those tropistic reactions in the human world. Yeah. And it means that... Uh, she examines the subconscious level of consciousness, how we react to other people, but we don't, uh, we are not aware of it. And she tries to put this material that we never, uh, when we are talking to people and meeting people, we don't, we are not aware what is happening beneath. She is pulling this beneath material into the writing. And uh, there is a word uh, for her method. It's uh, la sous-conversation, sub-conversation. And it means that people are kind of uh, communicating with gestures and uh, microscopic uh, uh, nuances, oh, voices. You're, you're, yeah. you're, 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 you're preaching to the choir on this. This is exactly what we were talking about, about what we miss doing this remotely. Yeah. The, yeah yes, all yes. the little things the, yeah. I get from sitting across a table from someone yes. and just seeing them and not looking at a screen and not, you know, everything we pick up like that. Oh, that that's wonderful. I have to start reading her stuff. Yes. But, but oh. she, she, uh, she's, she, the, she's the one who kind of uh, renovated the description of consciousness. Virginia mm -hmm. Woolf and other modernists uh, did went very far. But she went further because she went deeper. 
that's that's uh, if you want to yeah. put it very briefly what she did and and it keeps fascinating me and had did you ever interact with her? I know uh, I think she died in 1999, and you mentioned never, working on never. her. And oh, even okay. if I if I did had uh, a possibility, I didn't know don't know if I would like to <laughs> meet her. I respect <laughs> well, her so that, much. Yeah, that's a question I often have for for artists in in any field. You know whether you have met your heroes in your field, whether you've embarrassed yourself when you've met your heroes. Um, I mention it because the the great example I have is Irvin Welsh, the guy who wrote Train Spotting, who told me uh, that he stood up David Bowie twice um, because he was supposed to interview Bowie and then realized, I can't, I can't sit in a room with David Bowie. I used to have his posters on my wall when I was 10 years old. I can't do this. He just melted down and, and actually didn't show up to interview Bowie twice. Um, but yeah, nothing that embarrassing. But do you have um, sort of literary heroes you've interacted with or uh, like Sorot, you know, would have stayed away from, you know, even given the opportunity? Hmm. I do. I feel that uh, I'm in communication with, with the authors who have passed away, you know, mm. Direct way when I read their books. Yeah, and of course I I have many uh, colleagues and we talk about writing and literature very much and that is important because this is the world I really deeply live in. I I think about writing almost all the time. So yes, but I'm not. So, I don't feel that I'm a fan of some something someone. Um, I love many authors like for example my current uh, favorite author from united states is maggie nelson i really love her work but i'm not sure if i would love to meet those mm -hmm. i admire yeah and that might be an american thing where we you know we want that that sort of interaction or something or that that somehow there's a validation uh from from interacting with somebody you you idolize and i'll admit i've had that with uh certain writers who are literary heroes of mine who i've sat down with and came away from thinking i had a good conversation with you know clive james or this one or that one i i actually didn't embarrass myself so um but yeah that that's mm -hmm. going off on my my own tangent Tell me a little about the the literary scene. I guess in in is it Helsinki based? Is it is it national? I, I don't. I know so little about your country and its culture. Um, you know, can you tell me a little about what's what's you know yes, what literary well, life is like? Many there are many many authors living in in Helsinki, my colleagues, and we do interact. Of, of course, now it's pandemic, so we don't mm, yeah. see each other, but virtually and phone calls and etc. But uh, I think that in during the last ten years, something has changed. Uh, yeah. The Finnish literature has become a much more international. The books have been translated a lot, of, lot of more than uh, they had before. And for example, my friend and colleague Paitim Statovci, uh, he has this. Uh, he was candidated for National Book Award for translated fiction. We had the same had the same uh, translator, David Haxton, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Sophie Oksanen, of course, has uh, made a path with her success to other Finnish authors, but. What is different in Finland, in, in Finnish literary field, is that we do have now nowadays uh, professional agencies working. Mm. So uh, it's now about 10 years that Elina Alpak agency, where I'm in, was uh, grounded. And, and it has made a change. Because you might think that good book, if book is good, it uh, sells itself, but, but it doesn't. Mm. Yeah. You have to have so many people in between and working for the book. So there are some institutions and structures that have been developing recently. Hmm. 
And I think that uh, yeah. there are many, many authors, for example, Monica Fagerholm and Rosa Lixson, fin female authors that are so strong and good, and uh, and uh, Katja Kettu, etc. You might know some of them. Oh, they no, I don't at all. Okay, <laughs> they have been translated <laughs> into, I'm gonna hit into I'm going to hit... I'm going to hit you up afterwards for okay. spellings of everybody's names because I, right. I love learning, you know, uh, new authors and people I should yeah, be looking for. I will so. send you those <laughs> names. <laughs> um, do you, when you say the literature has become more international, do you um, do you mean that in a good way? Or is hmm. it just a, you know, is it something about, you know, um, the voice or subject matter itself? Or do you just mean in terms of, it's proliferating more in, in translation in other countries. I think it's the latter because, mm -hmm. uh, for example, those names I mentioned, they write very diverse prose and, and different kind of books. So uh, it's just that we do have translators, we do have agencies, we do have contacts more than before. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure if you meant it was that the writing itself was changing in order to oh. reach a different market than, than, you know, the national one. Okay. I, I was thinking about, uh, about the, how uh, the actual distribution can, can contact yeah. with Finnish yeah. writing. Gotcha. That's good. Cause I was afraid you were going to say, you know, things were better before, uh, you know, people started yeah. paying attention to us. <laughs> uh, is there a Finnish style or or voice or or sort of commonality in tone in in the literature or do you find it you know diverse diverse because in the US we only see little examples of things and we extrapolate from that into huge um stereotypes uh, and and we make these grand conclusions that turn out to be incredibly wrong when you look at the details uh i think that the literature in Finland is very versatile at the day, mm -hmm. and it has happened uh, also to. It, it was a poetry that was very experimental uh, years ago, and it is still, and and versatile, diverse, uh, many different voices. But what is, to my eye, what is a bit different in a good way, is that in a grassroots level, we do have uh, prose writing that takes inspiration out of uh, experimental things. So it's not only mainstream. And mm. there are so good writers making different kind of uh, a big experimental writing, but it's um, okay. I lost my <laughs> idea. <laughs> experimental, but accessible, Acc you yeah, know, in, in yeah. that way. Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the thing. Yeah accessible in terms of it's you don't readable. need a, yeah you don't need a phd to no. to get what's going on yeah so cool tell me about gendered writing and mm. and the choice within my friend natalia of not um not gendering the narrator the the therapist we're never told being a detective i looked for clues of course and i think i i saw one or two in there but um, having a book narrated by somebody for whom you don't provide the gender clues mm. and what, what gendered writing means to you. Yeah. Gendered writing has, of course, a long history. And I think it starts from uh, French uh, philosophers like Helen Sixou, Julia Kristeva, uh, Luz Irigari, etc. It's the écriture féminin, women's writing, which uh, which meant that that it's it's different from male writing. It comes from the female body. It's more fluid, non-linear, uh, and against Paulocentric writing, things like that. It was seventy-five, I think, that Helen Sixou wrote his famous essay, uh, "The Laugh of the Medusa," where he introduced she introduced the term uh, "écriture féminin," and. Uh, I have a problematic relationship to that because I'm very aware that uh, I, I see the world through women's eyes and, and experiences it. 
And uh, I think that all my books, all my three novels, they do have female main characters and some themes that have been considered as feminine or feminist. Um, so there is something that comes from the femininity in me into the writing. But it's not uh, without ambiguity, of course, because um, in the deep down level, for example, Natalie Sarot thought that uh, we are all the same in the level of those so-called tropisms. We are all the same, and even the animals are, are the same. We have the same reactions, same basic needs. But of course, we can't take the culture away. And uh, that was one thing that I wanted to put show show out in my friend Natalia. Uh, mm -hmm. when I book, created The Therapist as a narrator. And it's very important to me that the therapist is not gendered or defined as a man or a woman. And I did put some hints, uh, tips into the language uh, that are contradictory. Mm -hmm. uh, and some readers have said that uh, the therapist must be a man. Others have said it's a woman, and uh, some people have changed their mind during the reading, which yeah. means, I think, that uh, the reader must kind of confront their own stereotyped ideas of gender. And yeah. I, th yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. I, I started out with the assumption this was a female therapist and pages and pages in, I thought, did I, did I misread that? Let me go look and then realize, no, she's, she's deliberately keeping this from us. And, you know, once that ambiguity, you know, became, <laughs> once the cloudiness became clear to me, you know, it, it, it enriched the novel uh, yeah. very much, but I realized, you know, she must, she must know that a reader is going to come in attaching a certain set of assumptions to, to this and you know the the way you played with that I, I found very interesting great great to hear that uh, we have a little kind of it's not a problem but but a challenge when when the uh, audiobook was made in, in by <laughs> penguin random random house audio mm -hmm. and uh, I was very happy that the producer contacted me and uh, sent me some audio samples that I could listen because I, I said that this is very important that the narrator sounds sounds right. And uh, uh, finally, we found a very good reader, an actor called T.L. Thompson, uh, who defines uh, the uh, non-binary. Mm -hmm. And I think that that saved, saved the novel. <laughs> in, in Finland, uh, it was me who read the allowed the book yeah. into the audiobook because I am I have a feminine voice absolutely but I'm still an author so it's authorial yeah. voice you hear. Sure. Yeah. Yeah that's interesting. I I I was going to joke about uh uh Milorad Pavic, the 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 dictionary of the Khazars, the um the novel he did in the, the late eighties that had a male edition and a female edition um, basically three lines were different between the, the, the two books, but you could buy one or the other. Um, wow. I, was, I was thinking with the audio book that would have been, you know, we'll have a male reader versus a, a female reader and people can decide which one they want. Yes. yes. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, can you, can you speak a little about, you mentioned the, uh, when you were describing the, the, we'll say the plot or at least the 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 story of the the novel the painting uh that that is in the the therapist's office and how that sort of triggers where things go the idea of bringing other forms of art into a novel mm. there are a few illustrations and there's also other yes. examples of visual visual verbal art in in the book um but can you speak a little about that 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 notion of bringing other forms in as well as a form a, a piece of art that um 
I wasn't sure was fictional or not and, and right. decided to just accept everything as what was going on within the, the context of the book. But anyway, uh, yeah. tell me about bringing other forms of art in. Yes, um, it is because I really want to keep the tradition with me when I write mm -hmm. because I'm not alone. I have a huge, huge tradition of art behind me and in mm -hmm. front of me and with me all the time. And I communicate it with it when I write and when I think and when I live. So it, it goes quite naturally to take that stuff in and, and uh, communicate with and through it. But uh, one thing is that I feel I'm a very visual writer. Uh, I see things uh, first in images, as, as actually Natalia does in the mm -hmm. book. And uh, many books which I've, I've written, uh, they have start from a vision. I see something. For example, uh, with Oneiron, my previous novel, uh, I had it. It, it is uh, it uh, the the it happens in the afterlife, imaginary mm -hmm. afterlife, and it is wide empty space where seven women from different places, uh, they don't have same language, etc., just show up. And I have that wide space filled with women uh, in front of my eyes, just suddenly. Uh, in a huge, empty, wide space. And that triggered me to write, started the novel called Oneiron. And with Natalia, the painting, which is fictional painting, Your Mouth, Bouche Oreille, uh, I see it uh, with my imaginary eye, and I describe it very in detail in the novel. But for example, I have always said to all publishers that you must not uh, make, for example, this painting, put it in, in the cover of the book, illustrate it, because it needs to be imagined mm -hmm. with words. So, uh, and there are other, other uh, painters, for example, real life painter Nikki, Nikki Designs Bal, French American artist. And her work, My Men, is quite literally inside the novel. Yeah. Uh, the text part of My Men is written there by my hand. That means by Natalia's hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, I take a lot of... Uh, for also, the, there are citations, quotes from books because Natalia reads books as I do. And it is also the idea in the layering therapy that you take a book and start to imagine when you read it. So uh, it's in the concept of my friend Natalia to communicate through and with other art. Do you make other art yourself? Um, I took up drawing just a couple of weeks ago. I draw trees in my backyard. I've never drawn in my life, but, you know, it it's kind of interesting to me to do that instead of being at a keyboard and a screen. But Yeah. Uh, when I was younger, I, I uh, draw pictures, and mm -hmm. it was one, one way, other way to express myself by drawing. But uh, nowadays, I don't do it anymore otherwise, but writing... Uh, uh, in hand I think it's it's kind of drawing as well when you don't just tap with the machine but you are in a in a real contact to the paper with the pencil that is to me as a calligraphic meditation and and I feel it's almost like drawing do you write longhand yes I do um uh, I, do, I don't uh, write the novels uh, by hand. Oh, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. But I, of course, I make yeah. notes. But this uh, journal and diary project, uh, which is uh, very near to, to my writing, that I, I need to write the diary before I write the fiction. And with, when, at the same time as well. But, but it's like I, I communicate with the writing self when I write mm. the journal. So um... it, it's funny when you mentioned the journal at no point, uh, I, my assumption was that was all handwritten. You know, I, I think because mm -hmm. you mentioned the number of books, but 
I wouldn't even have, have you know, it wouldn't have occurred to me to say, oh, she probably sits down at a computer and writes, you know, mm. the, 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 the journal. Um, but yeah, I know some writers, even ones, um, you know, well, I don't know how old you are, my generation and younger, I'm 50, um, mm. who write hand, uh, write by hand and then type in afterwards because yeah. the, something about the interface between, you know, the, the hand, the keyboard and the screen, they mm -hmm. find less useful or more, um, more opportunity to, to correct, delete, never quite write anything because you can constantly change, yes. you know, what's in yes, front of that's you. that's true. And I have mm -hmm. a dream that the next novel or some, some other novel might be the one I, I first write at hand yeah. by hand, because, uh, that is something I haven't tried yet. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely one method to slow it down the writing process. Yeah, I, I've I've tried many tricks over the years, but again, I've reached this far without finishing anything. Mm -hmm. uh, my question, when you mentioned, you know, starting with with visuals and images, have you thought of or or worked with cartoonists in the past? No, have you thought of no. Okay, I haven't. I I I have, I have one big foot in the the comics world, so I, I always wonder about authors seeing things you know whether certain stories can be told you know in in a band -a or however you want to call it mm -hmm. um versus you know prose on a, a page yeah. so, so i can hook you up is what i'm saying if if you do think about that down the line but but anyway mm -hmm. neither here nor there um the thing i want to ask though from your description of oneron and and from reading my friend natalia how important is the idea of a a place for women to speak hmm. and how recurring is that a, a a theme for you i guess in that virginia wolf mm -hmm. uh room of one's own sort of thing because both from the description of that book and from this book you know it seems like oh women having an unmediated voice mm -hmm. um seems to be a thing yeah um I do have, for example, in a personal level, many communities, so-called communities that are based that my women friend and I, we talk, share things that I think needs to be shared there. So, um, yes, it has still, we still, still need that, I think. Hmm. And is there a, uh, I'll say sexist, culture as far as your your national literary scene goes from your experience or is it something that's safely enough in the past hmm. that's a sensitive question i apologize yeah, if it's no, something no you problem. don't want to answer I'm just okay. thinking of of course i always uh, now look look from my own perspective as an author mm -hmm. and uh, uh i feel quite free to write and express myself, but I know that there are other other experiences as well. Yeah, I just had no idea if there was a every writer you mentioned, uh, except one, have been female authors. Yeah. So it, it sounds like there's enough of a a um, a scene, I guess, as opposed mm -hmm. to you know, there's there's that sense of um, like with movies. If you can only see one movie by this, you know, whatever this non-white, non-male group mm. is, make it this one, as opposed to just letting these things all proliferate and, and be a tapestry, I guess. Mm. Yeah. But uh, I would say I have many, many uh, uh, authors that are male, which are yeah. very important to me. So uh, it starts from the book and the, and the writing, yeah. what I'm interested in. So we've been in, I, I call it pandemia uh, or mm -hmm. just our, our pandemic world. And I got that from another guest, a, a guy who's a cookbook writer, actually. He he was the first one to mention pandemia. And I thought that's that's a perfect term for the world we're all living in. Um, how is it, how is it externally 
for you one year mm -hmm. in and and your internal life seeing a book you know coming out in these other other markets after the original came out um uh it, in before the pandemic mm -hmm. how's your pandemic going i guess is yeah. is my my question, question. Yeah. yes uh, basically the work days are very same than before because i write alone at home so that hasn't <laughs> changed much and and i uh, of course uh, i see so those uh, people who are really near to me that hasn't changed too uh, and the writing itself it is very solitary work so uh, and and i enjoy it i think that situation is and i, I know that situation is totally different when you go to theater or music so in the, that way, uh, being an author in a pandemic time <laughs> is a privilege. Yeah. But uh, of course, it has affected me as well. Uh, the one thing is that I don't travel. Uh, I would be now in, in the United States. We could be it. doing this in person. This would, would have been yes, great. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and and uh, touring and uh, meeting people. So that is different. And I... Uh, uh, I, I feel that traveling is very hard work, but um, when this pandemic uh, goes on and on, I I see that I start to miss it as well. Yeah, yeah. So, Even my day yeah. job, there was a lot of um, a lot of travel that we really didn't think was that necessary. Yes. But now it's just like. I just want to go through the goddamn airport once yeah. and and go to a hotel and you know all these things. I've been a year. Mm -hmm. in my house i went over three months at one point without setting foot in a building other than my house so Ooh. yeah uh, we're all getting weird um yeah. is is you know um the the big observation a year mm -hmm. in do you see it impacting your writing the the yeah everything uh, I, yeah. I think that that is for me too early to answer it it because we haven't yet done <laughs> the pandemic yeah and it can continue. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> do you do you do you look at your journals from the past? Uh, not yet. Uh, I write them very enthusiastically at uh, this moment, but uh, but I know that there comes a time that I will reread them, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure that that I will see the how now this pandemic, for example, has has infected me. I will see yeah. it when I when I look them through, but still, I now I feel that I'm um, I'm in the middle of this thing, so I need a perspective, and I don't have it yet. Yeah, understood. Yeah, I was surprised because yesterday I looked up the 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 national dashboard for Finland um, to to see how your country is coping, and the. It seems much more severe now than I was expecting it to be mm -hmm. in terms of new cases. And I just, I was surprised uh, just because we're in the U.S. We're on this downward part of the the, the curve for the moment. Um, so I just sort of assumed, it's like, well, they're isolated. It's a homogenous population, maybe this or that. Every assumption I had was wrong. So, yeah, um, you know, we're all getting just beaten down in, in yes. a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, place you most want to go see when you when it's safe to travel again? Hmm. Is it something local? Is it something across the world? Um, I would love to go uh, into America, actually North America. I traveled yeah. there. It was uh, 2016 uh, when I was. Uh, Traveling to your country, uh, mm -hmm. started from New York and ended up in Santa Monica. Whew. And yeah. uh, partly uh, going by car and seeing different places. And uh, I would love to see some places again, like white sands, for example, or petrified just stones and yeah. these, these very, very strange and beautiful places. Arizona, I miss Arizona, <laughs> yeah. etc. That's, I would say, almost the opposite of Finland. That's, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. kind of neat to to imagine. Is there a, if I happen to be in Finland and was looking for, you know, literary um, uh, 
sort of a literary pilgrim thing, like a, a place where this author or this this book was written. Um, is there something that jumps to mind as as sort of literary landmarks in your country? Oh, there are many, but I think that maybe you need to go to countryside then. Um, yeah. What would I say? Of course, there are our national writers, uh, Alexis Kivi and his little <laughs> cottage. Yeah. But it's not like it's not very uh, phenomenal or anything. Hmm. Now, I, trust me, I've I've done some weird ones over over the years. That uh, if I happen to be in this country or this city, you know, let me just go to you know this, this particular place. So. Yeah. Yeah, I've, um, I've, 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 not that it's a thing of mine, but I figure <clears throat> when I'm, I'm, you know, I say when in Paris, you go find Proust's grave oh, and, yes. you know, you, you just have to. The Jim Morrison thing is fine, but, you know, mm -hmm. it, it was more about seeing Proust and Oscar Wilde and, and people like that. But mm -hmm. the other question I have that occurs to me through the, the, the Sarot conversation about tropism. Did has this the work you've done on her her poetics has it sort of influenced the way you you look at people in the day to day mm. like we were talking about with conversation how you're reading the other person do you do you think you've changed in any way from you know what you've learned from from working on her yeah uh, her I think that the work of Natalie Sarat first so much impressed me that was that I felt now I know what she's writing about. So there was some basic uh, uh, familiarity in, in the world she describes. But of course, uh, it has changed a lot uh, and writing, uh, working with her with so many years. I, I think that I, I, because she looks world uh, through a micros microscope in a many ways. And that means that uh, I really want to go deeper and deeper to understand what is really going on uh, under the surface. So I don't know, it is the same uh, mentality uh, with Natalie Serot, or have I learned it from her? Mm -hmm. But I have it. I really, and, Natalie Sarit wants to find old fashioned truth beneath the surface. And, and I have that strive as well. And she is your friend, Natalia. Yes. Or is she? You, you yeah. could say it's not, again, it's not simple <laughs> no, how no. she is in there, but she is there. Hmm. That's just a fascinating book. I'm, I'm, so glad we got to, to connect on on discussing this. Mm -hmm. So um, last question, which is a bit of a weird one. Writers, you would really want to see breakthrough. Is, is there someone in your, your literary world that you think, my God, I wish, you know, this writer yeah. was was everywhere? Yeah. Uh, Finnish writers. You mean? Yeah. 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 Uh, yes, there are actually many, but uh, if I need to uh, mention one name uh, who is not yet uh, widely translated, that would be Anu Kaaja. You're going to have to zap that one over to me too. <laughs> yes, yes, but absolutely. She she uh, makes very own thing. She has very uh, strange and beautiful poetics. Nobody else writes like her. Of course, there are others uh, which I love and have that too, but I see a lot of potential in Anu, Anu's work. And um, the question that all writers hate, regardless of where they're from, um, are you working on a, a new book at this point? I'm writing, yes, all the time, but <laughs> I think that the next uh, next thing coming out would be my my doctoral thesis, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which again was the the Nabokov pale fire clue that I was getting out of the, <laughs> the end of, yes. of the book. So, yeah, I was I was I just hit that moment of like, wait, is she, 
is she actually the therapist or is she, well, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll leave it open and, and, you know, it's better to leave it open, yeah. <laughs> but it was a wonderful novel. And, and I'm awfully Thank glad, you. like I said, to, to, you know, connect like this and it might even get me into therapy at some point, mm-hmm. which means you could Maybe end up getting try. subjected to, to my stuff, but, mm-hmm. but we'll see. But Laura, thanks so much for the, the time. And, you know, my hope is when we're allowed to travel, if you do get out to, to, you know, New York, New Jersey area, we can sit down and have this conversation in person next time. Yes, Jill. Thank you very much. I will. I remember that. And that was Laura Lindstedt. Her new novel is My Friend Natalia from Live Right Press. It is weird and sexy and philosophical and thoughtful, and I hope we give you a little bit of a a flavor for that from our our conversation, and I really hope you give it a read. It's translated by David Haxton. Now, Laura's on Twitter at Laura underscore Lindstedt, but she doesn't seem to post there. She does, however, post on Instagram as author underscore Laura Lindstedt, where she puts up some really fun pics, including one that I use in the uh, show notes for this one. And her website is lauralindstedt.fi for Finland. Uh, There'll be links to all this in the show and episode notes. Um, But here's how you spell the site. L-A-U-R-A-L-I-N-D-S-T-E-D-T dot F-I. So lauralindstedt.fi. Uh, there is an in English button for which I was quite thankful because as we talked about, Finnish is very, very different than English. Anyway, I enjoyed my friend Natalia and I hope you give it a shot too. Now you can support the virtual memory show by, um, telling people about it. Um, you can also, what I'd really appreciate Send me postcards or letters or emails or leave me a message on my Google Voice number, which is just set for messages. It doesn't forward to my phone or anything. That number is 973-869-9659. And when you call that, you can tell me what you like and don't like about the show, who you'd like to hear me record with, or what movie or TV show or book or music or, or other piece of art you think I should turn our listeners on to. And if you've got money to spare, then don't give it to me. I hope you'll support individuals and institutions in need. You can find people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, etc. If you're looking for somewhere to start with institutions or foundations, uh, I recommend you go to your your local food bank, uh, the Poor People's Campaign, Freedom Funds. There are a lot of things you can do uh, with your money and with your time to, to help us work towards a better world. Also, I still have some copies left of the first issue of my very first zine, Haiku for Business Travelers. If you want one, just uh, drop me a line or visit haikuforbusinesstravelers.com and hit me up that way. It's free. Um, You can kick in a few bucks for postage and production if you want, but this isn't a money-making thing. It's just me sharing my art, such as it is. Now, I do want to say one thing. Uh, nobody's listening because we're already at the end of the episode, so I'm not that freaked out about telling you this. But um, lately, I've been drawing. I took up drawing about six or seven weeks ago, and I just draw trees for the most part. Um, just trees in my backyard, my neighborhood, places I go. I just stop and draw trees. Um I've been including drawings of trees with the last couple of copies of Haiku for Business Travelers that I've sent out to people. I've only noticed now that I'm not writing anymore. Um, like the time I would maybe spend working on a, an essay or something for Haiku, I'm instead just going outside and drawing a tree. Uh, I don't know if that's where my creative thing is right now, but whatever. It might mean that we're going to be a little while before the next issue. Might mean the next issue is filled with drawings of trees. I don't know. The point is, I'm 50 years old and I'm still figuring stuff out. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. 
You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. Mm-hmm.